this now is the third week, our third week of studying um, Jesus' last and long conversation with the disciples. Um, and we've seen, we've seen what Jesus is doing. He's transitioning the disciples, preparing them for a new era, right? He, he's been with them, walking with them in the flesh, physically present um, for the last three, three and a half years. And now he's preparing them. He's, he's telling them he's going to go to the Father and he's transitioning them. Everything that was external, every experience, every, everything that they could touch externally, he's transitioning that to an inner reality in the spirit, um, to, to uh, experiencing that in a spiritual realm. And this is, this is what I've been trying to stress over these last months is that our faith, our faith does not only exist in the tangible physical realm. Yes, there is a very, very much an aspect of our faith in the tangible physical realm. You need to help people where they need help, right? Don't just say, I'm sending you my thoughts and prayers, right? Thoughts and prayers, yes, they go very far. But when the opportunity arises, get your hands dirty and help someone. Show them tangible love. But there is also very much a part of our faith that exists in the spirit realm that God welcomes us to. He says, this, this is for you. This is for you. This is for you. The world cannot receive this. Right? So this is something that we have that is, look, it's exclusive. Right? I know when we say something is exclusive, all of a sudden it becomes more valuable. It is exclusive to us as believers, what happens in the spirit world. God says, those of us that believe, we can see, we can understand, and we can receive it. And so, I don't want us to miss out on what happens in the spirit realm. And, you know, so two weeks ago, two weeks ago, we looked at chapter 14, where Jesus introduces the Holy Spirit to the disciples. Now, um, I guess the question is, how many of you have heard of the Holy Spirit? I think all of us have heard of the Holy Spirit, right? But it's one thing to have heard of the Holy Spirit. It's a whole other thing to have encountered the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit dwells in each of us. He is a living presence in each of us. But the Holy Spirit also works and moves in our midst. And sometimes we miss out on that. Um, you know, if you, if you choose not to see it, then even as the Spirit's moving and working right next to you, you you'll miss out. And, and so Jesus says, the Holy Spirit is coming. I'm going to the Father and I'm sending the Holy Spirit to you to dwell with you and to dwell in you. And... You know, Jesus says he's coming. He's coming to make a dwelling place, not just with us, but in us, right? And then we saw last week as we studied chapter 15, Jesus says that we need to abide in him, right? Now, he says, abide in me and I in you. And I know this is a very, uh, it's intangible, right? How do you abide in Jesus and how does he abide in you? Well, turn with me, turn with me to John chapter 15. <laughs> We see a uh, practical example of how we can abide in Jesus. Um, John chapter 15, let's look at verses 9 to 10. Jesus says here, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Okay, verse 10 he says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So there is, a, you know, when we talk about abiding in Jesus' love, right, I know it, it, is, it is a very vague concept when we talk about just those words. How do you abide? How do you dwell in someone's love? It's not a physical thing, right? And many times when we hear about this, we, we have this uh, idea of, you know, sitting around with other Christians, singing Kumbaya and, and just feeling good. Right? You know what? Abiding in God's love is more than just about sitting around and feeling good about it. Right? Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So, practical way to abide in God's love is to keep His commandments. Now, why does that help you abide in His love? Well, if you look at His commandments, right? The Bible is full of commands from Jesus. But Jesus, when he spoke to the rich young ruler, he summed up the commandments in two statements. He said, the first, 
commandment, the greatest of these is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. So every commandment, every commandment that he has given can be summed up in these two. So what, is, what, what are these two commandments telling us to do? To love. When you obey his commandments, what he's calling you to do is to love him and to love each other. So when, when you obey his commandments, what are you doing? You are practicing and living out love. When you are practicing and living out love, you are abiding in love. There it is, simple as that. When you are loving, as Jesus loved you, you are then abiding in His love because you're you're living it out, you're practicing it. Also, also, if you think about it, these commandments they were given to us not as you know something to to curb your fun and, and to make your life here on earth miserable, right? A lot of us we often think of rules as something that is meant to be skirted, something that's meant to be broken, something that's here to take away our fun, especially those of us that have parents, and you all have parents, if you grew up in a household where parents set down the rules, the thought a lot of times is, here we go again, always, always telling them what to do. You know, my parents just don't know how to have fun. And they actually wrote a song about this, parents just don't know how to have fun. Um, that, that was way back in the Anyways, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Jesus, and God, when He gave these commandments to us, these were commandments that were born out of love. As a dad, I know when I lay down the rules in the house, it's not because I want my kids to stop bothering me, it's because I care about them, right? When Alice and I think about what rules to set, we actually spend a lot of time thinking about it, what is good for the kids, what will benefit them, and then we lay down the rules. So listen to us, it's good for you. Right? It's born out of love. And so when God gives us these commandments, He is giving us these commandments born out of love. And so again, when we obey these commandments, we are living in His love because He gave these to us out of His love. We are walking in His protection when we obey His commandments. Right? So, so a very practical way to abide in His love. And, and ultimately, when we talk about the commandments, right, this is where we want to be careful. We don't want to become... Uh, what's the word? Legalistic. We don't want to become legalistic where it's all about following the laws, right? If, if you understand what the Bible is getting at, ultimately, each of these commandments is to draw us into a deeper relationship with Jesus. So, in the end, the ultimate goal of following the commandments is the person, the living person of Jesus himself, right? And so, that's how we would abide in His love, is as we obey His commandments, we are drawn closer to Him, we are drawn into His presence. That's, that's how this whole thing works. So there we go. How do you abide in His love? Obey His commandments. But look, in, in John chapter 15, right after Jesus tells these disciples these things, in verse 11, turn with me there, 15, 11, after Jesus says all of this, He tells the disciples to abide in Him, to follow His commandments. He says in verse 11, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. So he says, abide in me, abide in my love, follow my commandments, and my joy will remain in you, and your joy may be full, okay? Now, turn with me to chapter 14. Just look back on chapter, verse 27. John 14, 27, Jesus says, peace, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I am going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Okay. So in chapter 15, Jesus says he wants our joy to be full. Here in chapter 14, he says he leaves his peace with us. Right. So here we see his promises. Right? We have promises of love, we have promises of joy, we have promise of peace, right? Abide in my love. My love is there for you, abide in it. Your joy will be full if you do these things. My peace, I leave with you, right? Love, joy, and peace, love, joy, and peace. Where have we seen this? Galatians chapter five, verse 22, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. And long suffering and goodness and kindness and faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. But it starts with love, joy, peace. As you come to Jesus, as you live in his presence, as you abide in him, the three first three fruits of the Spirit start to be born out in you. 
and they're promised to you. And you'll start to see those fruits grow. And when we were talking about fruits, right? We were talking about how important it is to bear fruits because that's how you identify a branch that is living in Jesus versus a branch that's not. And so we saw, we saw that abiding in love isn't just about feeling good and feeling lovey-dovey. It involves following Jesus and his commandments. So then let's look next at joy and peace, right? These next two things that were promised. What is joy and what is peace? If you look up on, in, on the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, here's a definition for joy. And I'm going to say it slowly so you can process it. Joy, it's a noun. The emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. Not the actual possession of what you desire, but the prospect, just thinking about possibly owning what you desire, that is supposed to bring you the emotion of joy. I'll read that again. Joy, the emotion evoked by well-being, being, being well, being healthy, success, doing well, or good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. Here's peace, also a noun. It is a state of tranquility or quiet, Freedom from disquieting or oppressive thoughts or emotions, or harmony in personal relations. That's how the world defines joy and peace. Okay. Joy and peace, joy and peace. Well, let's see if Jesus gives us any details about the joy and peace he's going to give us. Uh, John chapter 15, uh, skip down a few verses to turn, turn to John 15 verses 18 to 19. Okay, Jesus is telling us we're going to have joy and peace, right? Here we go. If the world hates you, what? I thought we were talking about joy and peace here, huh? If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Jesus, um, you're going away and you're going to leave us and you're talking about leaving us with joy and peace. Um, I don't, the world hates me. I can sign up for this. Right? Maybe, maybe, you know what? Let's skip to chapter 16. Maybe we have better news there. Chapter 16, verse 1 and 3. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. Oh, that's good, you know. Jesus is telling us these things so we don't stumble. Oh, good. good. Verse 2. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you, because they have not known the Father or me. It's not getting any better, right? Now there's people who are going to kill us and think that they are doing God a favor, right? Verse 20. Verse 20. Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament. This is no good, Jesus. That you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. And you will be sorrowful. Well, but here's good news. But your sorrow will be turned into joy. Right? We're going to weep and lament. This is what Jesus promises us as he's talking about peace and joy. The, you are going to weep and lament as the world rejoices. But the good news is your sorrow returns to joy. Verse 31 to 33. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, has now come that you will be scattered. You've been following me all this time. The hour has come. Now you will be scattered. You are going to be disbanded. Imagine if I'm standing here today telling you guys, all right, this is it. The time has come. Shoo. You're all going to go your separate ways. No more of this gathering together. And that's what Jesus said. You are going to be scattered, each to his own, and you will leave me alone. You're going to abandon me. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace, in the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Okay? So Jesus says, in me, you would have peace, and my peace, I leave with you. But he also says, you're about to be betrayed, right? Or he says he's about to be betrayed by the disciples. He's about to be abandoned, right? If I were one of the disciples there, and he's telling me, my peace, I leave with you, and then he goes on to tell me that I am about to abandon him, I would say, Jesus, I don't know what kind of peace you're talking about, but no thank you. It doesn't seem like you're going to have a lot of peace because you're about to be left all alone, right? So, so what, is, what is this? I mean, you, you're probably thinking, 
Jason, this is this is a depressing sermon. You know, can we can we fast forward? On, if you're watching the video, maybe you can fast forward this. Can we just skip to the part, you know, where, where Gail shares about her trip to South Sudan? Because there's a lot of good news to be heard there, right? Um, we want to hear something encouraging, but you know, the world's falling apart. News is depressing. Give us a refund, man. Let's sign up for this kind of message. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Many times when we read Jesus' promises, we take them out of context. And we misunderstand what he is promising us because we read God's word with the world's definitions. Right? Listen, life is not simple. Life is not easy. When you were younger, maybe it seems like life is a little simpler and easier, but you know what? Even when you're young, you have your own troubles that you face. Right? As adults, you look back on it and you think, oh, it's a little trifles. But for a child, many of these things are, are life or death events. That I get invited to so-and-so's birthday party. <laughs> we, we joke about it, but for a kid, that, that's a big deal. Little kids pray about things like this, right? About my friends turning their backs on me and abandoning me. And, you know, these are all very real issues. Life is tough. Life is tough, no matter what stage you're at, right? But we read this and we are looking at joy and peace from the world's definitions. So, so we think once we believe in Jesus and he's promised us joy and peace, everything's going to be smooth sailing and there's gonna be no bumps in the road and all my friends will always love me and work will always treat me well and I'll never have any problems at home. Never have to fight any inner demons. Joy, as the world defines it, is the emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune. So we think, well, Jesus, if I believe in you, then I will be promised well-being, I will be guaranteed success, and I will have good fortune. And I think we've all heard rumblings of that kind of gospel, right? And that's not what Jesus is telling us. Jesus' idea of joy. John 16, 22, therefore you now have sorrow. You are going to have sorrow. But I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. The joy that Jesus promises us does not come from outside circumstances. It does not come from your physical well-being. It does not come from success. It does not come from good fortune. It does not come from the thought of owning those nice things. Yes, that is joy from the world's perspective, but the joy that Jesus promises is not that joy. The joy that Jesus promises you is a joy that comes from the Spirit of God dwelling in you. So that as you go through life, as you face all these circumstances of not well-being, of not success, of bad fortune, of the prospect of never possessing what you desire, when you hit all these things in life, the very presence of God within you walks with you and talks with you and gives you a joy from within that none of these things outside can provide. And this is that joy that the world cannot take away because the world can alter your circumstances all at once. This joy does not depend on any of that. Right, that is the joy that Jesus is promising us. You know, remember, remember, during this time, Jesus is trying, trying to help the disciples realize the inner spiritual reality, right? He's been walking with them. He's been leading them. When they're at his side, they, they have their needs provided. Now is going to come a time when they're going to be on their own and they'll be scattered and there'll be a scary time. There will be persecution coming. We, we see it in the book of Acts. But Jesus says, you will have joy as you sorrow. And this joy that's in your heart, the world cannot take away. Peace. Okay, peace, the world defines it again as a state of tranquility or quiet. So nothing's bothering me. When nothing is bothering me, then I have peace. Freedom from disquieting or oppressive thoughts or emotions. So... If I am free from this turmoil within my heart, then I have peace. If I can just feel better, then I have peace. Harmony in personal relations. So if we can just make sure everybody gets along, you know, I love you, you love me, we're a happy family, I should wear a dinosaur costume next week, then we have peace. Jesus' idea of peace. 
These things I have spoken to you, John 16, 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations. That's his promise. In the world you will have tribulations. The world will hate you. The world will hate you because you love Jesus. In the world you will have tribulation. But what did he say? Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, right? The world, let me tell you, brothers and sisters, the world may pretend to offer you peace, but the world can give you no peace because the world hates the likes of us. But Jesus says, as you have tribulation, be of good cheer because guess what? He has overcome the world. There, there's a peace to be had within. When you're living in this world and everything around you is in turmoil and everything around you is turning against you and you feel like, boy, the, you start to really feel that hate, right? The, the mask come off, the, 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 the facade's gone and the world starts to show how it really feels about us as Christians. And, and you're, you're thinking, boy, I'm feeling attacked. But you know what? There is a peace to be had because you know the one who truly matters, Jesus Christ, has overcome. Right? Imagine being in that turmoil. And you can stand sure and confident and stare all these circumstances in the eyes and say, guess what? I have already won. I have already won. My Jesus has already overcome the world. Anything and everything you can throw at me, my Jesus has already won. He has already overcome. You've, you've lost. You've lost. You can't touch me. Try. Right? When we look at the story of Job, long account of Job and how he was tested by Satan. He lost everything. His kids, his possessions. He was sitting there. The Bible tells us he was sitting there covered in boils and he had shards of pottery and he... I'm sorry, I hope you don't lose your appetite for the bagels. He was sitting there scraping his boils. Right? This is what this man's been reduced to. And yet, at the end of it all, at the end of it all, he, in his encounter with God, he was able to say, God, you are sovereign. You know what you were doing. And I praise you in all of this. Right? To be able to look at everything that is happening. And again, I, I don't say this lightly. Right? Things happen to us and things hurt. This world is not giving us an easy time. But we can stand and say, my Jesus, the sweetest name I know because he has already overcome the world. You know, I've said this many times, especially during times of worship. Whatever it is that you're facing in life. And I, I don't want you to ever think that this becomes just an easy phrase to say. I know some of the things that some of you are facing or have faced. And there are many things that I don't know. But I know and I understand that there are very difficult situations and circumstances that come our way. Right? Whether it's a difficult situation at school with your friends or with, with your schoolwork, or your stress with all that you have to do, you have problems at home, issues at work, conflicts within yourself. And I don't go through this very quickly to make light of it. But to say, I understand there is a lot going on in all of our lives. But remember that in our faith, Jesus never promised that those circumstances would just go away and fix themselves automatically. What Jesus promises is as we walk, as we walk through each of these things, as we live through it, when in those moments especially when we feel like I am barely going to survive, there, there, are, there, will, there may be nights, and I've experienced this, there were nights when I thought, I don't know if I'm going to make it until sunrise. I really don't. There, there were nights where I thought, Lord, please end this. I don't want to see you another morning. But during those times, we hold on to the promise that Jesus says, you will have joy in your sorrow and I leave you my peace. It is a peace that the world cannot give. 
One of my favorite hymns, my grandmother used to sing it to me. It was the first song that I sang to my son when I held him in my arms in the hospital. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. In our walks, whatever we come across, Jesus promises joy and peace. Bring your circumstance to the Lord. Bring it to us as a church. We can carry it with you. And he says, I will walk with you. I bear the burden with you. And you will make it through. Doesn't mean the circumstance will fix itself. There may be times when whatever you have faced never becomes fixed. But what happens is as you walk through that, you experience the love of Jesus in you and on you. And that, that is what we were being offered in the spirit realm, being able to have this life with us, being able to live it out, being able to experience it. And so I, I hope, I hope as we read these promises that we can understand more fully what Jesus is promising. And at, in those moments, and I, I, I'm sorry, but I guarantee you there will be more of those moments. But in those moments, when you feel like, I don't know if I can take that next step, please remember Jesus' promise, come and we will take it in prayer. Lord, let us bow our Jesus, I thank you, Lord. I thank you that as you promised the disciples, so also you promised us your love, your joy, and your peace. And Jesus, I pray, I pray, Lord, that you would help us as we walk through this life on this earth to know, Lord, how to come to you to receive and to live out that joy and peace. I pray these things in Jesus' name.